Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, uh, we're running this online, but I'm coming here from Gadigal country. Um, and my name is Saha Kalili, president of Fusion Party. Uh, and this is the July monthly members meeting. So welcome. Uh, what we have here just on the front, and we'll speak to this in more detail later in the meeting, is our values pyramid. So we've been thinking about how we really want to portray this. This is the current view of it. So we welcome any feedback um, and we'll speak to our member drive and our vision progress as well. It's been very important work lately. All right. So get that out of the way. Can you see that or no? Yeah, anyway. that's good. Okay. Um, member drive secretary's report. So um, we have Owen acting as the deputy sec. He's not here tonight. Treasurer is Michael, executive report, I'll just speak to that. Committee reports, housing policy, voice statement, and our vision. Okay, so Miles, would you like to speak to the membership drive? Yeah, absolutely. So about a month and a half ago, we uh, put together a plan to run a member drive to try and boost our members for the yearly AEC audit. It was not a, <clears throat> there was no critical need for members. We did have enough to safely make through the audit, but as um, I felt like there was an, an organizational priority to run a regular yearly focus to make sure that we did keep an eye on it and make sure that we maintain a safe margin for the audit. Um, this is a big this is a big change for those of us who've been involved in politics for a little while definitely in minor party politics because the registration requirement did triple uh, last about, about a year and a half two years ago and so we have had to um, re reinvent and redevelop the way we do politics so as part of that it, there's had to be this reassessal so for the member drive we had a target of 200 members across all states nationally and broken down, the aim was around 25 members in each state. And so the, we looked at um, shifting out slightly, depending on a state presence, right, off the basis that the uh, larger or, or the states where we had a stronger presence would be more effective at recruiting. The numbers didn't end up showing that. <clears throat> so with the, uh, with the initial design rationale, the focus on decentralization, the idea was that the, uh, the concept was that by supporting our members and encouraging our members to... Uh, to to publicly identify as members of Fusion and talk about Fusion with their friends and family, that that would be a um, more more overall effective method of recruiting than focusing on a small number of uh, I, I guess centralized party organizers. And um, so uh, the the theory was sound, but we fell fairly far short of our targets um, for the most part. And so uh, there's. Uh, a lot of points we can review as part of that. Um, one of which was that there wasn't um, so, some of the promotional channels, which I was initially planning to do the member drive through, didn't go ahead. And uh, ad additional points as well. Uh, we did end up managing to get three named recruiters working through, uh, which um, together, so I, I was one of those, and together we managed to get a good number of recruiters, a good number of new signups. Um, the uh, so as we can see here, the um, the top state was Queensland with six recruits in total. Then New South Wales had three, and Victoria had two. Um, so there was a significant lead for Queensland. Uh, of those, I I recruited two of them. Um, and so for um, there's potentially some reasons for that, uh, but <laughs> obviously I wasn't fully involved with a lot of them. So so that's that's pretty interesting. But given the given the general small response. Um, compared to our target, we definitely need to do a reassessal and uh, reconsider the way we communicate. But I think there are some good lessons to learn here in terms of what is effective and what isn't. And there was good feedback as well from even from people who didn't participate in the member drive. Um, I think that uh, it, it was something that a lot of people were interested in. And so this has the potential, if we can keep it up regularly, this has the potential to come a um, bit more of a, a, a party tradition to make sure we do keep our eye on one of our organizational requirements. Yeah. Thank you, Miles. I mean, this is something that we definitely need to be doing more of. So we'll have more of these in future. And every time we do it, we'll be learning more and more. Um, do we have any questions from the audience or anything anyone would like to share or ask of Miles? Michael? Um, 
I'll just make Bridget also just raise, raise the hand um, just to, after me if that's, um, uh, there's a Zoom function as well if you want to do that. So it pops you up to the top of the, the list. Um, but um, yeah, I was just going to say that I think, I mean, it's a little disappointing with the the, the numbers, but um, I think the, the where I think of it is the, uh, the other, a lot of the other work we're doing in other places. So, so the things around formalizing the vision, uh, a bunch of the policy development work, um, and various various things where we are sort of clarifying the brand, and we will have more things that we'll be able to use. I think are going to be beneficial to um, sort of sort of the, our outreach and and things. We sort of I think if um, generally if, uh, if if you're if you're harder to sell, then improving your brand is the is, is, is the way to go. So um, I think, we're, but I think we're doing a lot of work in that in that vein at the moment. So I'm looking forward to. Um, what the results, the further results we have beyond this, and uh, definitely keen to know about more about the the, lear the lessons learned from this process. Yeah, I mean, this is a learning experience for all of us. We're all learning together. Um, Bridget? Thank you. Um, I guess the first point I want to make is that, that there's a really big movement happening in Victoria at the moment around... Um, uh, the Lord's Prayer at council meetings. So this is kind of a secular movement, if you like, talking about removing the Lord's Prayer. I think that could be a really good uh, recruitment opportunity um, in terms of, for me as a counsellor, but my constituents will also support this kind of thing. There's a really big movement in um, Burundara, which is the council next door to me. They've got a case going to possibly, depending on the outcome of council meetings, about uh, you know abolishing the Lord's Prayer at council meetings. So I think that could be a good point of recruitment. The other thing I did want to say, just in terms of the very first slide, um, I'm just wondering about the point on deep ecology. Um, there's a very historical sort of uh, basis to that. I don't know if you know that the feminist movement has some issues with the deep ecology movement. Um, and I hope you're aware of that. Oh, um, yeah. When Did we that... get that slide later, happy to hear more detail on that. Sure. Yeah, so the, the the deep ecology point is something that came out about 18 months ago in, during the um, early conversations of the party's history. So we were looking at what was sort of the points we had in common. And at the time... Oh, actually, Miles, sorry, were you going to say something about this? We can talk about yes. that. On the, yeah. yeah, 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 specifically. So um, the uh, with deep ecology specifically, I've been raising a number of times that there is a long history and a number of associations with deep ecology, which are may not necessarily um so some members some parts of the deep ecology movement will may not or will not associate with part of fusion in terms of overlapping visions of values oh, sorry miles are you speaking to the member drive or should we move on i'm just responding to bridge's point no 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 i said that we were going to speak about this in the values okay well i, mean, I, I said my piece anyway about that just let's keep this uh tight because there's a lot to go through so is there anything you wanted to add or can we move on we have a lot to go through uh, to quickly respond to Michael's point, <clears throat> um, the one of the core ideas, the mechanisms behind the member drive was encouraging and enabling members to stand up and identify as fusion. And so, yep, definitely agreeing that uh, a clearer and more cohesive brand will support that sort of identification. Thanks. All right. So now we've got our membership numbers. So let's just look at this all together. Um, because these are just these are red hot, just come in today. So at the moment we have seventeen thousand thirteen members, which is great. Um, so, and here we've got the breakdown of how our growth and movement has happened with our membership. So we do get some losses over time. I guess when um, people come out of the woodwork and and you know realize they hadn't actually been following emails and things like that, and that's going to happen. Um, but overall, we've remained pretty steady. Yeah. Okay. And there was another slide here. Oh, that's for finance. So any questions with members? Just very quick questions. Okay, good. All right, we'll move on. So this is for Michael. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you, Saha. Um, yeah, I'll keep this brief because it's as riveting as always, usually. Um, so just uh, the month of June is usually a bit of a hectic one. Um, we did send out in the uh, oh, my headphones out. Um, I did send we did send out in the newsletter as well as a separate email, uh, the reminder of the uh, donation cap to political parties. So as we're a registered party, people, people can claim uh, donations. Um, up until a certain amount, but sort of obviously based on the AEC uh, requirements. And uh, so we did receive a certain number of donations, a decent number of donations come through at the end of the month following that, uh, following those emails. So thanks as always to everyone who has donated. And if you have any uh, need for uh, additional receipts or anything like that, feel free to uh, email at contact at fusion or um, uh, treasurer at fusionparty.org.au. Um, now, just on the details, the in the profit and loss, so we received uh, $1,679 in donations, so that's that bigger bigger chunk that we usually get. However, there is a larger, a much larger pool of expenses in this month as well. Um, predominantly, uh, this large amount in IT services and subscriptions, it's a bit of a catch-all for a lot of things, but about 400 uh, of that also is our normal monthly expenditure that we pay for things. And the rest is us being hit with the bill for Nation Builder, which is our primary tool for uh, our membership numbers, our website, um, and all sorts of services that we use that for. Now, we were creamed a little bit on the um, uh, exchange rate and uh, international fees and things like that, unfortunately, that we have to pay there. Um, and so uh, it's a little bit unfortunate. We had that was sort of a bit more expensive than, than uh, we, would, we would like it to be. Uh, but that is probably the biggest, that is the the largest expense we have all year. So generally we keep a bit of a float of, of funds um, exactly for that purpose, because we know that's 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 sort of coming up. And we and um, so now if we go to the next slide, we'll just see sort of how much we have that float, uh, sort of a fair amount of that float is ex sort of has been expended. Um, but that's okay because we it's the majority of what we needed the float for. So um we definitely need to build up the coffers again for um, sort of future campaigns and and, and elections uh, that are that are coming up. So we'll want to look at doing some more fundraising and and, and bringing those up as soon as we can. Uh, but overall, because we've made sort of we paid those big bills in the last uh, that that one and a couple of other ones in the last couple of months, we're we're pretty good for keeping the lights on for for a fair while. Um, so just at the end, with our sort of our net position being. Um, uh, 50, about about 1500 and there's a few a fair few things in this list here of around accounts receivable and, and liable that's just sort of some of those bills that are um just not quite out of the bank account or something yet so but the actual position there is that 1528 um so not uh so it's not a whole it's not a huge amount but it's uh it's 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 plenty for us to to do what we need to do and um yeah well, hopefully we can we can make some changes to that in the next little while and get that okay. get that up again so just a question, the total amount that Fusion have, has at the moment is this amount here, 1,500? That's correct, yes. Okay, yes, so we're, we're very poor right now. Okay, any questions? Feedback or suggestions? If anyone here is a fundraising guru or would love to just jump in, we would really appreciate anything like that as well. All right. Uh, so next. Quick, a quick point. We do notice uh, uh, the majority of our donations come through around election time, which is also when our expenses spike, but it's not uncommon for a um, little bit of money to come through. And the other note as well is that when we have a members join, that's often when we'll also see initial donations too. So a successful recruiting spree, which also happens around election time, we usually bring a spate of donations too. Mm. Yeah, that's correct. And the, mon the monthly donations we have from people are, are really good because that, that just sort of gives us some um, some consistent sort of income and we sort of know what we're getting there um, to, to some degree. Um, and yes, we, we, we definitely, it, having a sort of a rallying cry uh, is is pretty important for, um, for sort of for fundraising. Um, we need to make sure that we're, well, I mean, th there's a few things that are coming up. So like there's, there's the voice stuff and uh, you know, these kinds of things. So um and yeah any elections are always a good uh we, we need to give people the reason to to know that their money is going to something useful so uh, definitely we'll, we'll and that's why we're here with the transparency mm -hmm. so this new slide here the executive report is not something that we've really uh, touched on in the triple m meetings 
but because we really want to be transparent throughout and we want to have more of that visibility of, um, you know, members to be able to participate in our executive meetings, we have them every fortnight. Um, so the next one is due tomorrow at 7.30. If you would like to attend, um, please send us an email at exec at Fusion Party. Um, and if you want to contact anyone from the executive or just to know who are the organizers and the executive in Fusion Party, this link here, Fusion Party slash R Party, has all the details there as well. Any questions? Yep. Okay. No worries. All right. So now committee reports. So we have three committees running Fusion. We have the policy committee, which is headed by Michael, engagement committee headed by myself, and comms, we have an announcement for that as well. So we'll just go through it. Um, policy, Michael, would you like to take that? Yeah, so I think on the next slide, I've got just a couple of very minor, uh, very brief points, I think, or was that on the, that's on the housing stuff. So yeah, so um, uh, in general on housing, um, there is the, um, the, the, the main focus of uh, sort of detailed policy development has been around uh, affordable housing. Um, Peter Johnson um, has been uh, the primary chair of, 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 of running this, this sort of working group, uh, and we've been doing it based on a, a relatively complex process that is sort of deserving, um, or that, that a sort of a complex policy topic requires, um, and we have released our sort of first phase report. Um, this went, up, went through by in the, um, in the last newsletter. Now, this, this is a report that is primarily a focus on the sort of the problem identification, so the reality of, this, of, of, of the current um, housing crisis. And it is quite a long and detailed report. Uh, it is a working document, so it's not something necessarily we're sort of advertising as a, as a, as a thing to, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's not sort of the, the, the policy proposal or anything like that. Um, but there is a summary in there that sort of gives us a, uh, the, the, I think reading the whole thing would be is, is, is fantastic, but the, the summary in there is um, a, a, a yeah, general summary of, a, of our findings. Now, the next steps we are looking to undertake, uh, and there's been some delays recently, but we're getting sort of into the, the meat of uh, the proper uh, policy develop, development of that based on that policy assessment. So, so on that problem assessment rather. So understanding the problem and, and having all those details is, is really key to uh, making sure everyone's on the same page and understanding the problem and and sort of coming at the solution or coming for this with the solutions for sort of for the same problem um so building that up, up that understanding um now just on external contributors what that means is we are sort of sending that out and sort of asking for submissions from a number of other groups so there's a few other uh sort of various organizations so not some nonprofits and various sort of concerns, we want to make sure that we're sort of getting as much information as we can and allowing sort of contributions from sort of advocacy groups and uh, and other organizations. So a lot of these around sort of social housing um, related organizations and things like that. So we want to make sure that we are getting as many perspectives as we can um, while still making like making sure that we're uh, thoroughly assessing those on an, ev in an evidence evidence based um, methodology. Um, and then just yeah, with our next meeting on that on is uh, is is, is wet next Wednesday week, um, so a week from now, um, at seven. So uh, on our website in the events page, I believe there's a there's a place to RSVP for that, um, and there should be uh, I, I believe that should have been in the newsletters as well. Um, mm -hmm. Bridget, I saw you uh, raising your hand there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think. As you know, all know, I'm staunchly independent, but very supportive of this group and um, really keen to collaborate with you all. Um, I actually put a, a motion up on the back of the federal government's um, uh, announcement of the $5 billion to social and affordable housing at the last council meeting. Um, and so that was about, you know, the largest bit of land we have in Yarra, uh, trying to reinvigorate that as a possible space for social and affordable housing. The Greens actually uh, voted that down, but it was actually mentioned in the federal uh, Senate, which was really nice to see. So 
Um, I would be really happy to collaborate with you in any way I can on this. And if you could help me in terms of progressing this in the city of Yarra, that would be fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll show you the event to RSVP too. Yeah, we'd love to, love to have you along on Wednesday. And then also, um, yeah, I can shoot you an email or you can shoot us an email at policy at uh, fusionparty.org.au um, with anything that anything there will get considered. And yeah, we'd love to have a chat further as well. Yeah, so the uh, Queensland Greens have made a major part of their platform at the state, local and federal levels to um, make renting more affordable. And so it's it's kind of an irony that at um at different levels of government around the country that they're also taking actions which are making renting less affordable or, or, or blocking action which will uh, improve access to affordable housing and um max chandler mather has actually written opinion pieces about this to say that in some cases they are taking a deliberate stance not to work with labor and to be deliberately obstructionist in cases where they could have uh, improved renting affordability in order to go for um you know the typical grandstanding approach so there's a lot of potential here they are getting a lot of support for their grandstanding but at the same time it's not necessarily for genuine reasons or not with any kind of uh, meaningful policy goals mm, yeah, it's been a bit and of i think i think miles on that i i think you know how do we actually show them up on that you know like really and truly um in my municipality for example you know the greens have got a lot of traction and people believe their lies I, i'm not saying this is at the federal or state level but certainly at the level it's really troubling that um they actively vote down motions that could support social and affordable housing yet um you know people and so many other things never mind that uh, it's it they're really good at their propaganda and I don't know what we do about that the right. um the, the trick will be to deploy propaganda of our own but do so in a way that's actually genuine yeah and in a really positive way as well because I, I find personally that um you know, dissing the Greens doesn't really work. You know, like mm. you need to be positive and on the front foot. It's really tricky. It is a really tricky space to undermine, to show them up for their lies without looking like you're being nasty and bitchy. You know mm. what I mean? Like that's my my challenge anyway. Um, Bri, you did have your hand up before Angus. Thanks, yeah, I was on mute too. Um, so um, I'm just wondering, was there a rationale? This is going a bit down a um, rabbit hole, but was there a rationale they put forward to not approve that land for use as affordable housing? Uh, they were suggesting it should be used for a community hub, but actually behind the scenes, what it really was, was the fact that this was something that be before the Greens had control of Yarra, this is something that a uh, broader Yarra council that had two Greens, two socialists, number of independents. We'd worked with the state government on a mutual agreement to use this space for social and affordable housing. And the Greens basically wanted to squash that because it was an ALP agenda at the state level. Um, and so, yeah, so, and they're just being, you know, persistent with that, that they wanted as a community hub, which is ridiculous because it's, you know, it's the only big space we have in Yarra that would be available for social and affordable mm -hmm. housing. There is a heritage building that is the soldier and sailors thing on Hoddle Street, which we could use as a community hub. And that would satisfy all of their concerns. Um, yeah, so it really is a, a tit for tat kind of political issue in my yeah. opinion. All right, thanks. Angus? Yeah, hello. As Con's perspective, I do believe not actually like fighting other parties, but just batting, beating our own drum to our own policies. 
and keeping that, sticking to our point. Because there comes actually to how a few people is, well, they don't really actually enjoy seeing them fight, well, parties fight against each other and stuff like that. And they don't enjoy all the negativity. They did like, <clears throat> sorry, hearing about people actually were like putting out their own points and their own info about actually trying to slam anyone. But also at the same time, I do think we should take an approach to not condone any of those activities or at least bring them to light for understanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michael? Um, yeah, on the interest of time as well, I'll just probably move on shortly. But um, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, I'm one of the people who will occasionally uh, listen to question time. And it's uh, some of the things I, I heard some exchanges between Labour and Greens on this issue. And uh, it is incredibly disheartening to see the candor, like the the um, the the, uh, the uh, attitudes and and um, behavior, the, the sort of the way that they talk to each other in general. Um, it's very counterproductive. Uh, and yeah, I think I, I absolutely agree, Angus. Just coming to things with our own solutions um, and sort of actual sort of productive and positive. Uh, plans is is the way to go. Um, it takes a lot of work to do this, um, especially with something like housing. It's uh, there's a lot of people that try to make it like it's make it out like it's a simple issue, um, but it is absolutely not. And um, yeah, it's 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 one where we're working on, and and hopefully we can get something out soon that we can really be uh, very proud of. Mm. Thank you. So yeah, if you want to get in contact with the policy team, the email for that is policy at fusionparty.org.au. We also have a policy intake form as well um, on our website. So you can just click on that and submit whatever's tinkering around in your head because we'd love to see that engagement. So we have an events calendar. Um, so this is on our events page too. It's fusionparty.org.au slash events. Um, and that will get you access to our calendar so you can just keep up and, and won't need to see all of our emails to get the reminders. You'll just get it on your phone. So we have that. Um, and then just some pri um, pirate branch events coming up. We've got the National Congress AGM on the 22nd of July and the Pirate Party's International General Assembly on the 29th of July. So if you want extra um, information on that, please contact Miles. Miles? The, uh, yeah, members of Fusion are invited and welcome to join, even if you don't consider yourself a pirate. The um, PPI General Assembly, they will discuss uh, European politics quite a lot. There is quite a number of elected pirates over there, most uh, strong at the moment in the Czech Republic, uh, obviously with the situation in Ukraine, um, which is quite complicated, uh, but obviously we're very concerned about the European pirates are also very, very concerned, particularly those in uh, Eastern Europe. And so they have a very unique perspective on that. Yeah, thank you. All right. And now for comms. So Angus, uh, welcome. Congrats. You're the new chair um, and you'll be chairing these meetings in future. So I'm just showing the ropes. <laughs> so yeah, anything you'd like to say, Angus? Yeah, sure. Oh, yep. Yeah, okay. Anything you'd like to add or? Um, nice to meet everyone. And I'm doing the best I can learning okay. on the job. And thanks for giving me a chance. Yeah, Angus has been really good behind the scenes. People wouldn't, wouldn't have known that uh, the majority of the Facebook posts that we go out are all penned by Angus. So good work. Uh, okay, next one, voice statement. Bryce? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm Bryony. Um, I'm on the Fusion Exec as a branch representative, and I'm in the Policy Development Committee. And I'll just give an update on Fusion's position on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. But before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the unceded lands throughout Australia and recognise the continuing connection to land, waters and community, paying respects to elders past and present. And I'm calling in from Wajuk country near Borului or slash Perth. So the Policy Development Committee has been drafting a position for the Indigenous point, uh, Indigenous voice to Parliament. Unfortunately, it's not. We haven't got it signed off by the exec yet, 
Um, I think we're planning to, we're looking to do that this or next week. So just a bit of background to the voice. So the, the proposed voice is an essential component of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart is an invitation to the Australian people from First Nations Australians asking, Austra asking Australians to walk together to build a better future by establishing a First Nations voice to parliament enshrined in the constitution and the establishment of Mac a Makarata Commission for the purpose of treaty making and truth telling. So this, the Uluru Statement from the heart is the largest ever consensus of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on a proposal. And it's an invitation to all Australians to recognise Aboriginal people as sovereign. The voice to parliament would provide an efficient and meaningful uh, kind of a system for First Nations to advise on issues that first that affect First Australia, First Nations Australians. Um, and it would be an advisory body to Parliament. It wouldn't have a vote in Parliament or broader administrative responsibilities for Aboriginal affairs. And how it would work is the voice would have two members from each state and then also from NT and ACT and the Torres Strait. A further five members would represent remote areas and the members would serve four year terms and the two chairs, one male, one female would serve two year terms. So constitutional recognition of the voice is required so the voice can't be scrapped as with previous representative bodies such as ATSIG. And the const constitutional language in general lacks detail um, to allow flexibility. The detail would be in the supporting documents. So the legislation has the voice legislation has been approved by both houses of parliament and is set to go to national referendum in November, December. So in terms of Fusion's position at the federal election last May, Fusion stated that it supported the indigenous voice to parliament and the Illinois statement from the heart. And this hasn't changed in our draft position um, on the position we've been finalizing. As per all fusion policy development, the PDC works to our values and principles. And you saw the six values there. There's principles underpinning all of that, or the rather values underpin the principles. Um, the voice aligns strongly with principles, particularly under equity and safety, the values of equity and safety. Um, and on the next slide, if you want to go to that, Saha, I've got um, some of the, the relevant principles highlighted there. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing this? We've got equity and safety. Yeah, equity and safety. So just one of the, I've just picked two of the, the principles. So be unafraid to implement temporary forcing pressures on equitable outcomes, such as quotas, in the course of pursuing more fundamental and long-term stable mechanisms. And for safety, um, there's consideration to the outsized impacts of otherwise minor concerns must be given where those concerns impact children and vulnerable people. These concerns should be considered for extra protections, preferably of a systemic nature. Very good. Um, and then just, I, I don't wanna spend time unpacking the main points of the YES campaign, because I think these kind of speak, I assume these speak for themselves. Um, I would want to look at the two separate no campaigns just really briefly. So there's the kind of nationals or Murdoch kind of right wing no campaign that that just usually smacks of racism. There is a lot of misinformation in it, and it it sort of implies it it states that the voice is undemocratic, um, and it sort of implies that the voice will have a vote in parliament, which as an advisory body it does not have a vote in parliament. Um, it, prior, it protests the prioritising of one group over others and says that First Nations already received more largesse on average than other Australians per capita. Uh, and it is about 100, you know, 50% as much largesse goes per capita to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Islanders as it does to other Australians. But the majority of this is greater use of public services not dedicated Aboriginal services. And we are not closing the gap. So really something systemic needs to change. Mm. Um, and then the First Nations No campaign 
um, is, has really strong points, and that is tokenism, that this will, the voice will be tokenistic. And we can see that it, it can, you know, it will likely go this way in the narrowing of the scope, as um, Albanese said. Why would the voice have a comment on the, the climate safety mechanism? Why would that, why, you know, it's the voice is supposed to represent issues that um, are pertinent to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and Abor Australians. And so for Albanese to step in and say climate policy wouldn't be re uh, relevant to them is an example of that scope being kind of constricted or narrowed. Um, I, I heard the same comment from another Labor MP on, on whether the voice would have a, an opinion on changing the date of Australia Day, you know. They can so, have an opinion. What's that? They can have an opinion. No, no it said they, they wouldn't be, you know, they, they sort of, they implied they wouldn't have be, be putting forward a proposal on that. Mm. So we can see already the powers that be trying to constrict the scope and make it a bit more, you know, potentially make the voice tokenistic. And another key point from the No campaign from First Nations is that it will be a kind of, it won't, it will be a stop short and it won't continue um, to Makarata or so sovereignty, full sovereignty, you know, that kind of idea of treaty or agreement. Mm -hmm. And then another point is that it can't be, sovereign how can this how can the voice be a step to sovereignty if it's embedded in a colonial structure which makes perfect sense mm. um we kind of the the, the I, I should say that 80 percent of the biggest surveys that have been done 80 percent of people identifying as aboriginal or torres strait islander support the voice at this stage but there's still time for these for campaigns to take effect we feel that like in the the pdc we feel that um a no vote would be leveraged for greater division and stopping progress stopping any progress so but this is this is a really complicated issue mm -hmm. and i'll just leave it at that and i think bridget you wanted to Add something on uh, Yarra's position, Yarra Council's position. Um, I can't actually offer something on Yarra Council's position. The Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Council has not come out with a position in support of the voice, um, and I'm I'm I doubt that they probably will because some of the elders are against it and some of the elders are support it. Keeping in mind, we have Lydia Thorpe uh, as, you know, she has an office in our electorate. Um, but I think, I think you've made some amazing points, Bryony. Uh, I think um, uh, I think I we really need to be mindful of the fact that despite the fact that we're under Woiwurrung uh, Council, who are our traditional land owners that whose land I speak on today, who have never ceded sovereignty, they may not come out with a particular position, but the community is much broader than just the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung. We have many other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our community who are in favour of the voice. Um, uh, we do have Lydia Thorpe as a very strong voice against uh, from a, for pro proposing a no position. Um, and I think um, I think what's really pertinent there with regard to that is that many Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people say that, um, okay, so we're working on treaty across the country. We've got treaties going on in, in Western Australia, in Victoria, in New South Wales, in Queensland, Australia. Um, and so treaty is actually on the agenda and that's probably something that is a state issue. The voice is about constitutional recognition. It is not about, um, and I think it's a very well-considered position the Uluru Statement from the Heart is very well considered. It's about 
voice, treaty, truth, Makarata. Um, so I think I think basically we need, from my perspective as a local representative, I need to take into consideration all of the community. It's broader than just the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community as well. It's about bringing our nation together, walking forward, correcting the wrongs from the past. It's about so much more. And I, I'm not really sure what we're talking about tonight, whether we're going to have a position on this, but I strongly urge you to do so. Um, and I think it should be in favour of, of that. And as a strong independent type person, uh, there is a fabulous campaign going on with the Together Yes campaign, which is about uh, ki kitchen uh, conversations, which is about trying to get the message out beyond just the local community. I've been having lots of conversations with many people in the community beyond the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. But definitely from where I stand, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community is very much in favour of the voice. It is about constitutional recognition. And I hate to see, I would hate to think, if this does not get up, I would be devastated to see how reconciliation would be uh, set back in so many ways for so many years. We already see the Aboriginal community um, absolutely uh, disenfranchised, uh, you know, disempowered, so many things. We're looking at closing the gap. This is about closing the gap. It's about so many things. So I urge this group to please support the Yes campaign. That's the plan, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's what, you know, that's, I can, 90, I, I can't see anything stopping us supporting the Yes campaign. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I can speak from, yeah, as well. I mean, uh, Bryony is speaking from the PDBC perspective as well, um, as, as in the same way I would in, in that we can say that um, we we do already have the official position of supporting the Yes, yes campaign, so for, a very long time we've had the um that <clears throat> we've, we've we've been public on supporting the Uluru statement from the heart and um and the 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 position that we're bringing out uh the position statement that we're bringing out is more of a sort of fleshing out of that um of that position uh with a fair bit of it being our kind of sort of yeah how as Brian said how it works at, with that within our values and principles and some responses uh to the various no uh campaign so I'm, I'm really excited to get that out when we can um and and yeah i think there's uh, a lot of uh things there's a lot of things to um there's sort of a lot of points to to address there's certain ways in which you can say that it's very complicated and certain ways that you can say it's very straightforward as well um and i think the i, I want to just mention on the point um around the indigenous no um sort of arguments that of course as Brianie said uh, somewhat as well that we do respect very much those those um uh, those those arguments they're there's it's they're not ones what that we really refute from a um a, a sort of from in, in any sort of strong strong way the majority of the reason i would say why we support the voice uh in fact in in light of those would be um that we still believe that the voice would be a uh, a positive outcome and that the, the referendum failing would be uh not a, a very bad one ideally uh well, I, I would i would i would assume not ideally sorry um and so yeah i, I think we can pretty confidently say that we are in as a party in support of of, of the referendum of the yes vote yep uh thank you michael austin keep your hand up um austin you okay while we're waiting for austin i just wanted to mention i picked this up at the library very old school thing to do but um voice.gov.au if you can yeah it's just voice.gov.au so what we're planning to do at fusion is um set up an education session so we can really explore our position and as well explore some of the oppositional positions with the no campaigns 
and have a really informed discussion because the point here is with democracy to work effectively you need to be informed and that's what we will facilitate um so austin are you yeah ready? can you hear me now yes sorry i'm still driving home from work as well. yeah no we saw that's okay yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm just trying to get it all, all lined up i would i just want to say um uh how i look at it really quickly i'm going to be voting yes right i decided that a while ago and then i tuned out completely because i'm very cynical about the albanese government's motives here right and i think it's symbolism and it's a distraction on two levels one is a distraction from more substantive action towards a treaty all of those indigenous campaign indigenous no vote campaign reasons i'm not convinced that I'm, i think that that's all true but it's still worse if it fails right um mm -hmm. if it if, if we if we cannot hand the right this victory and i'm also cynical because i think this this kind of symbolism um stuff is the labor government's way of also avoiding other issues like the housing crisis like wages like other stuff that is you know their responsibility and they're not taking action on right and the fact that this is divisive and the fact that the murdoch media get up in arms and you know run this racist uh, dog whistle campaign all works for labor because labor loves the labor leadership especially loves to promote an image of a divided australia which is really not progressive and blah 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 and that's true on certain issues but it's not true on many other issues when it comes to wages when it comes to especially wages and tax you know the core issue that labor should be running on economic equality they have strong support and they do not act on that policy they go and act on something where they have where they got where they know they're going to get pushback so that they can paint themselves as more progressive than the population which they are not on most issues they pick the one or two issues where the population is to the right of them and then they die on that hill because they do not want to succeed they do not want to achieve deep social change they want to buy more investment properties for themselves because they're a bunch of and my good thing in my audio cut out then all right rant over thank you yeah divisive politics uh, michael uh yeah just to respond to that sort of directly as well i mean i think that um a lot of what you said there was very um uh, uh, kind of to expand on the position uh, from from fusion as well is that yes we support the yes vote but uh, we absolutely need to make sure that it is not the only thing it's it's a it's a first step um and uh, the uh, see like we as Bryony said we can't allow it to just become tokenistic um as as it as is a really reasonable uh criticism and a real risk and it is the responsibility uh of sort of other parties of 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 fusion and uh, i would say as of independence such as yourself bridget uh, to to hold the majors to account for these things if we we sort of can't let them say yes we're doing that we're doing things where look how much we're doing um but when it's just not enough it's it's just it's when it's uh not enough or it's just lip service then um they are not doing anything and so where it's our role to to hold them to account and call that out and make them do better i love it good rah rah okay so we we definitely need to have another session i think to just really get into the deeds uh, the details of that because there's a lot of interest there clearly um but let me just check what we have okay only one more slide that's good all right so we've got our values here this is the value pyramid. So just to touch on this quickly, um, what we, or actually, how about I just ask people, what what does this say to you? Let's start with that because I could talk about it, but yeah. Bridget? Yes, sorry. I've been around for a long time and deep ecology is, is a ding, 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 ding. Uh, as an eco-feminist, that is really problematic. Um, deep ecologists, basically, traditionally, were about saying, okay, well, you know, if the world's overpopulated, just let them starve and we don't give a shit, you know. Whereas eco-feminists had a, an ethical position around um, these sorts of issues. So it was about deep ecology versus eco-feminism is about ethics. Anyway, that's all I'll say. Oh, that's 
Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> um, Bryony? Thanks. Yeah, good comment, Bridget. And I will say, you know, the history of those words, deep ecology, it was like we did fight over them. We were looking for words that said nature has value in itself. So that that it wasn't just about, our, you know, what we could derive from it. And um, so we fought, we just searched and searched and searched for words. And then I suggested deep ecology and I don't have that background with it. And Miles, Miles put up a stink and for a lot of reasons. And um, but we fought him down. And so, yeah, it sounds like we need to revisit that. Uh, two people have phrased it. So, yeah. It's I'll hard to encapsulate it. Originally, the phrase was web of life, which was. That's a bit, right. Yeah, yeah. We're like, whoa, whoa. Okay. Mm. Miles? Yeah, so my, my take on. To butt in. Sorry, Miles. I'll just say, I think the word ecology is really important to have in there. But I think deep ecology has very significant political ramifications or implications for anyone who knows anything about political history so i would chuck deep ecology but i do like the term ecology somewhere in there mm. i would say uh anyway i don't know just uh, it's up to you people please share send send an email yes the feedback is that like have. is that like the conference of rome people the the people who say you know it, the limits to growth book and all of that is that deep ecology? Oh, I'm also no. saying no. <laughs> no, no, that's that's a very different thing. Okay. Okay. Um. Anyone else wanted to add, Miles? Yeah, from my perspective, uh, I consider myself a social ecologist, uh, which is what um, which is definitely in um in contrast to deep ecology while there are overlaps and i didn't i didn't uh, strongly advocate for fusion to be uh, a social ecological movement i think broadly there are some some subtle differences which my own personal politics quite closely aligns with but the broader party doesn't necessarily um from from the perspective of social ecology uh there's <clears throat> been some historical um, tensions or disagreements between social ecology and deep ecology um to brief super briefly get into the history um uh, deep ecology has been home to some uh, of the more fringe areas of the environmental movement um so bridges obviously raised the the depopulation agenda which has had a a maybe not an omnipresent voice throughout deep ecology but a significant or, or notable presence um another area of which i've had concern and social ecology that concerned is how some elements of some some uh influences within deep ecology have also looked at um the, the concept of the uh, um, uh, personification of nature. And so it, it in some areas, it's a deeply spiritual movement. I consider myself a spiritual person. However, um, th th those elements of deep ecology branched in a very religious direction, which is a secular person I've, I'm very oh. uncomfortable with. And um, uh, there, there's specific names for it, and I'm quite happy to uh, sort of talk a bit about that in detail, but it's a bit of a sidetrack. <clears throat> so... From, from a social ecology perspective, we <clears throat> we are we we do have a perspective on the web of life. We do think that um, ecosystems have value and need to be uh, protected, but also that humanity needs to be able to integrate with that, and that we can look to natural systems as inspiration for how to uh, 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 remodel or, or change or change our human relationships and the human relationship with nature. But that we should be able to integrate our our, our technological capacity and our innovation and our curiosity without losing what it means to be human, which sometimes deep ecologists, I think, uh, are quite blasé in, in terms of simply saying earth first. Well, well what about humans? Where, where does that leave humans? I think this is a good opportunity for a, a session to explore all the different perspectives on ecology, because I know this is a really big point for Vote Planet as well. So yeah, we'll do that. Um, so, and Bryony, you wanted to speak to, this is, um, this statement here is from the vision. Just process. before you yep. go on, Sarah, I'd just like to say I have an honours thesis in eco-feminist theory, if you'd like to. Um, I would love to, actually, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Can you send that in three dot points, Bridget? Um, so am I talking to the, to the, the, um, Oh, the just um, yeah. Any update on okay. the vision so far? Yeah. So, so the the vision was something we we did our values um, 
coming out of the federal election, we sort of, the PDC put some underpinning principles. And then more recently, um, we started working on the vision. And we, it's just so important because we do have, as much as we, we're so unified on a lot of things, we're like overlapping Venn diagrams that are, have lots of overlap. But then we tend to prioritise different things. So we needed to say, no, let's come in. We need to be inward looking for a while before we can sell ourselves. And uh, my sense is, you know, fundraising, everything, membership drives will be much easier once we have a cogent picture of what who we are. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, basically, so the, the resulting vision was Fusion Party Australia. And I mean, we spent weeks coming up with these words. My hope is that they, they're not um, kind of haven't been watered down in the effort to make them meaningful to all of us. Mm -hmm. But Fusion Party Australia strives for a free, fair and innovative society for current and future generations with meaningful work to meet the critical social and ecological challenges of our times. Fusion's approach is to empower communities and foster deliberative democracy across our society. So it is about that um, mobilisate the world, um, free, fair and innovative, and that speaks to our advancements, um, uh, forward-looking, and then to that, uh, that, that kind of um, libertarian air, that free and the fair, that, that we all feel that there's just great injustice at this time. These are the, we need to change these things. Um, mm -hmm. For current and future generations, so our equity, value of equity extends to future generations as well. Um, with meaningful work to meet critical social and ecological challenges of our times. So this is the idea that in fixing uh, ecologies, climate emergency, et cetera, mobilising all of the, the really critical challenge we, we have is a vehicle or a catalyst to change how society is, is structured. And, and this will mean people have meaningful jobs because they're doing things for the future of the planet for a healthy society, not just making crap to sell. You know. yeah. um, <laughs> Fusion's approach is to empower communities and foster deliberative democracy across our society. And that really is that deliberative, obviously, as it says, deliberative democracy that, that we love, which means people being informed, people engaging, but also having a reason to engage because what they, they say will can be integrated into decision-making processes. There's a lot there. And I'll just touch on, um, so the triangle here. So the hierarchy of, of our statements is the vision is at the top. The vision is the inspirational. This is why we're even here. The values come under the vision. They support the vision. And then the principles would be supporting the values and they feed into the policies. So you have your vision, your values, principles, policies. Um, the reason why this is hierarchical like this isn't to say one is more important than the other, but is saying that the ones here at the top are the most idealistic ones um, and the ones here at the bottom are the most practical and the most broadest uh, ones that we want to achieve. So, you know, we really want to ensure we have equity for all, ethical conduct and all the way to the top. You really can't have individual freedoms without that equity to begin with anyway. So yeah, this is a very conscious, deliberate hierarchy there. Um, Austin, you had your hand up? Yeah, I'm, uh, the language I'm hearing here, there, it has to me a slight, um, there are moral overtones that I don't necessarily think are helpful. For example, when we talk about meaningful work, but we don't talk about wages or prosperity, right? Um, the point of, were, and the idea that someone said, oh, we shouldn't have people just making stuff to sell crap. The reason I'm not a Greens member is because I believe in green growth. I don't believe in a degrowth agenda. And I, my understanding is that Fusion is a pro-technology, pro-prosperity, pro-human party. And the language should reflect that. And there should be talk about prosperity. There should be talk about plenty. There should be talk about high, about raising standards of living, right? Um, all I'm hearing is all the stuff that people should do to be good people, 
right? Um, that they should be doing work that's meaningful to solve problems, right? But what we need to be doing is delivering pe to people comfortable lives. That's what we, I, and I think that we can't be afraid to say that, you're, you know, we want you to have a house, we want you to have a car, we want you yeah. to have consumer goods, right? Because otherwise, what's the point? I'll, you know, like, then we're just, we're just another Greens. Yeah, no, I hear that. Right? It's really, really good feedback, Austin. Um, and, yeah, I agree. Um, in terms of degrowth, um, I know we're not, I'd say we are, I, Drew, um, one of the exec members, wrote a great position paper on it. We're, we're bright green and we're also deep green. So we are about that bright green future of technology, et cetera, but we want to also protect the ecologies and do everything that's required to protect them. But I think we do, you're right, we, we probably do need to revisit that and weave back in that prosperity. And I also think people finding meaning outside of work is something we should be celebrating as well. People expanding leisure time, allowing people to pursue parts of their life and goals in life that are not a job at a factory or a government bureaucracy somewhere. Yeah. Right? That you are not your job. That there's more to life than that. I think um, the points that you're touching on, Austin, are um, collected in the individual freedom. So we're saying that when we do everything that allows equity, do it in an ethical way, allows safety, et cetera, we'll get to that ideal prosperity and freedom to be whatever you want to be kind of thing. That's, I think that's the ideal progression with our values. Where we're and really I would agree with that. I would agree with that vision entirely. I just think we want to put it on the surface. Yeah. What is our um, unique selling point? We definitely missed out saying prosperity and things like that. On I'm going to I'm gonna switch from my car Bluetooth to my house now, so I might lose you guys for a minute, but I'll okay. drive back. No worries. Thank you. Miles? Oh, that's a shame. I wanted to respond to some of Austin's points. So we, uh, the one, one of the aspects of the process that we went through was that there was quite a lot of content to work through, but quite a lot of nuanced content as well. And there were many, many different points which we had to work through. Uh, out of the, to, to give an idea of the process for, there was six of us and we started with six individual personal vision statements. We also reviewed the branch vision statements and we also, um, to get an idea of structure, we, we reviewed the vision and mission statements from other major parties. And so there was a number of different points. Uh, we also reviewed the values and principles too. So there's many, many different points we went through uh, as, um, as part of the broader plan, this specific uh, the, the intent of this specific area was to narrow down to a, um, a, a short, concise statement in a way that would um, guide or, or overarch more detailed and, and nuanced uh, declarations of our platform. And so in, in that sense, we had a practical challenge um, with that in mind, a very practical challenge to actually be able to refine the content we work through, because there's so many things we care about but we can't go out and say to people, um, we can't go out and give people a shopping list. That's that's not a way we can really communicate or promote or campaign. It's, it's just not practical. So okay. um, so for Austin specific points, um, there there was a lot of there was a lot of discussion around all of those points actually. Um, the two that I want to highlight was uh, the concept of an innovative society. Um, that that statement made it through, that, that specific point made it through to the vision statement that um and that was an acknowledgement that uh, from a uh, from from I guess more of a market anarchist or, or libertarian perspective, that when you do have free exchange of ideas and um, an open culture and open access and open technology, then that improves quality of life. And so uh, the that kind of tied back to the idea of empowering communities. And originally that point was empowering communities and individuals, but then we felt like empowering communities touched upon this more broadly, where um, if, if we can empower communities, then that's analogous to improving quality of life for people within those communities. Yeah. So um, to quickly, quickly cap it off, I just threw a bottle of water across the room um, to quickly cap it off. The point about meaningful work, I was, um, I think I was one of the people uh, pushing for that quite strongly. And, and we did get some agreement with that. I'm coming at that from a very anarchist perspective where um, from an anarchist perspective, we look at meaningful work in a, a post 
um, this is sort of like a post-capitalist or a post-work environment where um, we re redefine work to, um, in, in, in David Graeber's words, get rid of bullshit jobs. And so that, um, that, that's not just to say, you know, meaning uh, like socially meaningful work that is also financially rewarding, but also things that we wouldn't traditionally consider work, but you could do as a full-time vocation. As, as many of you probably know, or would become familiar with the, um, the, the, the gray army in Australia who retired and financially comfortable are now devoted full-time to whatever their heart's calling is. And many of them do turn to politics, turn to volunteering, turn to activism. And so without, um, without a full-time career anymore, now their, their full-time career is whatever their passion is. And quite often that will be focused down to volunteering or certain kinds of activism. And most recently we've seen the, um, the, the, uh, this, this gray army coming out to join a lot of climate movements, such as the gray rebels and extinction rebellion going out there and um, physically putting their bodies on the line to, to protest injustice. Yeah. Knitting nanas. Yeah. Bridget? Look, I, I, I don't want to butt into this too much, but I think advancement is a pretty, I don't know what the fuck that means. Um, <laughs> you know, you've all said stuff around that, but I think, something around ecology should be next and I think equity and ethical conduct should be really high up there and safety comes after those two things so and whatever you mean by advancement put that in there too but I think you're missing in my humble opinion I think you're missing something around um, biodiversity as well here um, we're not here on our own as a human species. We live in a ecological web that is incredibly important. That's my two bobs worth as an outsider who is a staunch supporter. No, this is very valuable. I think it's more valuable if you're an outsider or if you're fresh to it um, because this needs to be easily translatable. Uh, I just wanted to um, say, though, this is kind of uh, replicating Maslow's hierarchy. So whatever's at the bottom is the absolute, like, need that kind of way of looking at it. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, another way to understand the, the hierarchy is that individual freedoms is constrained by advancement. So individual freedom there is constrained by all the things below it. Um, deep ecology is constrained by safety so we want deep ecology but if safety is a threat from whatever reason um maybe you know well we need to build wind turbines even though it requires mining or whatever you know uh ethical conduct constrains those above it and equity is is so in 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 a, in a sense sort of like as as saha said equity is the the big thing we're working towards um, or it's the must-have. The bare minimum. Yeah, bare minimum, yeah. So should oh. that be at the top of the pyramid? I don't know. Like, I mean, yeah. and just thinking about a Maslow's hierarchy, I mean, from a feminist perspective, hierarchies are, you know, like, anyway, for me yeah. it's more of a web. But anyway, I, I really love what you're doing here. I think it's really commendable stuff so hats off to you all yeah it's been a journey <laughs> um miles yeah so in the in the stages of developing this one i raised same concerns as you bridged the concept of or the idea of conceptualizing it as a hierarchy um and i'm i'm still not super happy about it but the the way um so the party member who originally took us through this process, the way he um, he explained it was that it's not strictly a hierarchy, but rather it's portrayed as a hierarchy for ease of communication. But in operation, it operates more like a um, the, the fountain model in uh, project management, where <clears throat> um, instead of instead of really being hierarchical, instead it's more or process based, and so you're meant to um in, interpret it in a uh uh in in, in sort of like a, a follow-through fashion and the the 
the the visual hierarchical structure is simply to indicate the order that you go that you you go through them. Um, from yeah, from a conceptual um, perspective, uh, it's it's not something I'm familiar with until we got into it. But being more familiar with it now, I can see uses and applications for it. And um, uh, so it's uh, this isn't necessarily, you know, gospel for us. It's just that this was a process we went through where we had a large degree of consensus from a um, very diverse political ecosystem that is inside our community, inside our party. And so um, we, we are going through new and uh, new and regularly processes at least on a yearly basis or more more than a yearly basis, such as the new vision process, where we do look at new ways of developing consensus and developing identity. And so while the values process is relevant now and while a vision statement is re relevant now, we're going to come back and we're going to revisit and re-go through these processes again in future, maybe differently, maybe the same, and uh, as a process of reinventing ourselves when necessary and um, and changing and updating and growing just like a, an ecosystem would. Definitely. Brian, I'd like to speak up to Brian. Yeah, yeah um, I, I agree with Miles. Like at first I was like, oh, this is so complicated. And then I'm, I totally love it now, um, the structure. One way I, I, I like to represent it is to put concentric circles with individual freedom in the middle and then those, those the values going out. And to me that more, it sort of escape, it gets away from the hierarchy idea and makes it more constrained by a yeah, kind of yeah. idea. Yeah, um, I think it, what would help this as well is perhaps a narrative. Um, so yeah, we definitely should revise how this appears, but the way I see it is um, we aim equity for all, um, but it has to be in an ethical way, has to ensure we have safety, and the interaction between safety and advancement, um, advancement was uh, related to the science party. So it's about, you know, advancing, you know, uh, having better technologies for all, um, better medicines, things like that. Um, but we prioritize safety over advancement because we don't want to advance at the expense of ecology, at the expense of safety, at the expense of equity and ethical conduct. And then the pinnacle, the, the final like ideal utopia is everyone is free. <laughs> I'll just um, add that advancement also includes um, sort of just societal advancement in terms of uh, sort of better structures, more um, sort of knowledge, knowledge sharing and, and um, sort of uh, uh, yeah, better institutions and, and, and things like that um, as, as sort of like skills in uh, our skills in things advance that can be shared and uh, yeah it's sort of it's sort of a it's just it's just general improvement some of the things to what Austin was talking about in terms of um, it's just, it's like prosperity in general is is sort of encompassed by advancement yeah um, Richard yeah look that's that is very commendable and I think um, that really has to be because advancement what you know, as a, that doesn't mean much, but when you flesh it out, it is meaningful. But I think also it has to be around um, not just human advancement, it mean, needs to be around how we survive as a species going forward in the future. Um, so, yeah, I, I love it. And what you've all said is, makes it clear but I think putting it there in terms of the way the general public would read that mm. um, it needs a bit of fleshing out but I, I get your point it's a good conversation starter that's for sure <laughs> okay so I think that's all of our slides the next slide is just that our next meeting is Wednesday 2nd of August so thank you for staying on 20 minutes past um, any questions or final thoughts and uh, if you know, if you want to contact us, I hope you all know how it's contact at Fusion or exec at Fusion. Um, any questions or final thoughts? Hope you'll have me back again. Oh, loved having you. Thank you for coming. Of course. Yeah, come back, Bridget.
Yes. Well, yeah, thank you. And so we already have two sessions in mind. We'll speak more about the voice and we'll speak more about ecology. I would really love to dive into that as well. So thank you. Thank you all. And this recording will be shared on YouTube. Cool. Thank you. Good night. Bye all. Thanks all.